I'm Jillian, a soon-to-be LSU graduate, journalist, and cooking enthusiast on a mission to inspire a deeper connection to the food that we eat. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm traveling around the state to meet the hardworking farmers and ranchers behind market booths and grocery store shelves, and to explore the journey my favorite ingredients make to my plate. So join me on a culinary adventure around the Bayou State to hear the stories behind the farmland we drive past on I-10, I-49, and all of the country roads in between. <coughs> Let's discover what's made in Louisiana. We're spending the day at 312 Beef in Slaughter, Louisiana. My day began north of Slaughter, where owner Josh Morris and intern Hunter were building fences in Jackson. The, the fence that we're building today is going to be to cut off this 120-acre pasture. They won't have the whole place to run on. Um, so that our, we can let our grass rest, so we can let our ground rest. Uh, also helps with nutrition, it helps with worm load, it helps with all kinds of things. This pasture hosts their heifer development program. We're just trying to develop heifers to, um, to put into our cow herd that are, uh, as the old ones get old, they move out and the new ones come in, and that way we keep rotating new stock in. Watching Josh and Tara run their business today, you never guessed that they were first-generation ranchers. We raise cattle, and, and we're the first ones in our both of our families to do it. Uh, my grandfather had cattle whenever he retired, uh, but then when it got to be a job, he sold them. And so I didn't really get a chance to fool with it a whole lot then. Um, we just kind of learn as we go. We mess up, we change what we do, and we go on. Uh, we have had some really good mentors come along the last few years. But as Tara unpacked meat from the butcher with delivery man Grant back at Slaughter, it was clear that I was speaking to someone who truly knows beef. 312's story is one I've heard more and more as I visit farms. They started raising grass-fed cows for their family, but turned their passion into a business after seeing a need in their community. So I looked into it and we started running numbers and looking into options and we decided to give it a try. And we thought we would sell four steers the first year and we sold seven. And the next year we expected to sell 10 and sold like 17. And it just, and then COVID hit and we went wild. These are some nice chuck roasts that we've got coming in and our soup bones are actually, we have to kind of- Today, they offer a wide variety of cuts for delivery and pickup, have hired multiple employees and have even started supplying ground beef to schools and parishes around the state. People love our ground meat because it tastes so amazing. And then also I really love our bone-in soup bones the round steaks, and anything to that effect of cooking down and making a gravy. And kind of my easy go-to is our stew meat on a night that I just need a quick dinner. I'll throw some stew meat in or our brisket patties. I love those as a hamburger. And Josh really loves the fillets. As a direct-to-consumer farm, customers can order through 312 Beef's website, which comes with its own challenges. Uh, it's a lot of talking to people and answering phone calls and, and putting yourself out there to be a direct sales yeah. business. But she says it's worth it for customers to know where their food is coming from. One of the biggest things that I'm trying to communicate to people in their marketing of their farm products or foods in general is that people have lost trust in the grocery store foods and they really want to know who their farmer is. And so what's happened is they get to the big um, processing plant and, you know, all the ground meat from all the cows goes into the big vat and then they just mix it all up and that's how they get their ground meat. It's super efficient. Uh, you know, that's the best way to do it for them um, to keep their costs down. Totally understand that. But you don't know what you're getting. Um, you don't know where those cows came from. Uh, there's still no um, uh, point of origin um, mandate from the government yet. So those cows could be from anywhere. The transparency resonates with consumers, like customer turned employee, Madeline. So as soon as I moved to Slaughter, I found 312 Beef online and looked into it for quite some time before I ordered and decided absolutely wanted to order from them. And it was, it was awesome from there. After lunch, Tara got a call that her sheep had wandered into the neighbor's yard. Farming is always unpredictable. It's a lot of adventures. We try to just look at it instead of challenges, we just consider them all adventures. But with the help of Jess the dog, she was able to guide them back home. Around 95% of U.S. farms are family owned, which adds to the personal, sometimes unpredictable nature of the job. 
with Josh and I have been working together almost since day one of being married. And so we really got thrown into that and didn't mean to. And it was a great bonding experience for us. So now we really have learned to play off each other's strengths. I, I think of all these crazy ideas and he helps ground those and say, okay, well, this is realistic and this is realistic. That may be, let's delay that a little while. He brings me back down and I bring him up to thinking bigger, I think. Their business style encourages external partnerships too. The Morrises hope that as more residents buy from nearby farmers, Louisiana agriculture will grow. We can grow so much in Louisiana and a lot of that's being imported. So the more we can support that and not buy imported foods, the more farmers there can be. As consumers turn to local producers and farms sprout around the state, there are more opportunities for connections and partnerships. Probably 50 different varieties that I grow at a time. Like the one 312 Beef has with fellow slaughter farmer, Justin from Kennedy Family Farms, who shares their passion for encouraging Louisiana grown food. If we can continue to grow, there can be a higher demand so more people can do what we're doing and the money can stay local. They join the voices of farmers around the state, hoping to create a healthier, more delicious Louisiana. I think that we can grow almost anything in Louisiana. Welcome to my kitchen. Today we're making my favorite food of probably all time. We're making rice and gravy, specifically steak and gravy. So many of you probably know rice and gravy is this umbrella term for so many different dishes in Louisiana. You have just your basic rice and gravy, which is usually beef and a gravy over rice pretty self-explanatory, but there's so many different offshoots like steak and gravy, which is what we're making today. You can do it with pork chops. You can smother any kind of pork. You can smother chicken. You can make sticky chicken, onion gravy, meatball gravy. There's so many, some people even consider gumbo rice and gravy, which if you think about it, it, there is a gravy and there is rice. So I'll take it. Not only is it my favorite food to eat, it's also my favorite food to cook because once you have your rice and gravy method down, which can be different for everyone, just like every food in Louisiana, you can just do it at any time with anything. This goes for so many different recipes, for me at least, in Louisiana. I can make it one way one night and completely different another week because there's just so much variety. I like to include other ingredients, maybe something that's in season, things that aren't typical. I know whenever we're making steak and gravy at home in my family, my dad loves to put some mushrooms in there because he knows me and my sister love mushrooms. It's a great addition. It's not necessarily traditional, but that's what's great about it. You can throw whatever in the pot, whatever's in season, whatever you're feeling. To get started, I'm just prepping the veggies. I have the Holy Trinity here, one large green bell pepper, one large onion, two stalks of celery, and some garlic. All of this is just gonna get a nice even chop. I, whenever I'm making rice and gravy, because it's gonna be cooking for so long, try not to chop my veggies too small. If I'm trying to make a quick rice and gravy, which we're not today, I'll chop them a little smaller, but I like them to keep some form of texture. If you're using a big Magnolite like I am today, you can just throw all your veggies in the lid. So for garlic, I'm gonna say about five cloves, three to five. I'm not the garlic police though. You can put as much or as little as you want, but I would put as much. Now that the veggies are prepped, let's talk about the cut of meat we're using today. This beef is from 312 Beef, of course, and as you can see, it has a little bone running through it in the shape of a seven, which is why it's called a seven steak. I'm really excited to use this today because it's gonna impart so much flavor into our rice and gravy because of that bone. It's such a great cut to use for this, and it's one that's not super available in grocery stores, so I'm really excited to use it today, and I'm happy that's what 312 Beef recommended to us. Like I said earlier, I make rice and gravy differently every time I do it, and something I've been trying lately is taking some of the fat off of the beef and rendering it out, and here's why. I'd rather cook the beef in its own fat, its tallow, rather than a neutral oil. My dad always says that if you're not adding flavor, you're taking it away. So basically what he means by that is if you what you're adding to the pot isn't adding any flavor, it's diluting the flavors that are already there. Of course, like a neutral oil is not gonna ruin 
your rice and gravy. That's how I do it most of the time. But in my head, I'm thinking if this oil can add flavor rather than a canola oil that's gonna add nothing, I'd rather use this oil. I'm seasoning the steaks pretty liberally with the Best Stops Cajun seasoning. You can use any seasoning, any Cajun seasoning, of course, but I like to use this one because it has a little bit of sugar in it, just a little bit, enough to really help the caramelization on the beef, which is where the flavor in our rice and gravy comes from. All of our prep is finished. It's time to start cooking. I'm putting the beef fat into a cold pan and then I'm gonna turn on the heat. That's gonna give us the best render of the fat. For my pot today, I'm using this beautiful original Magnolite Roaster. I believe it's an eight quart. It's new to me and I'm very, very excited about it. It makes the best rice and gravy. I've rendered the beef fat. Again, this is an unnecessary step. I'm gonna add a little bit more in just to be safe and then we're gonna sear the meat. I have the meat searing on medium high heat. Because I'm using a nice heavy bottom pan like this, it's gonna get a great sear. That sear, that crust is what's gonna flavor the gravy. It's the gratin. There's a million different names for it. I just call it delicious. That's where all of the flavor is. And it basically starts in this step. You gotta get this step right. Luckily, it's a pretty easy step to get right. All you have to do is lay the meat down and let it cook. Don't pick it up until it's not stuck to the bottom anymore. If the bottom of the pan is kind of looking burnt, don't worry, that's exactly what you want. Our veggies are gonna pick up all of that at the bottom of the pan. I turned the heat down to medium low and now I'm gonna pop on the lid and just let the veggies do their thing for like 10 minutes. The veggies have picked up all of that flavor on the bottom, so now I'm gonna turn the heat up a little bit and let them saute for like five more minutes. This could be an unpopular opinion, but I like a thicker rice and gravy. Not too thick, but I like it to have a little more body. So I'm gonna add about two tablespoons of flour just to help thicken it up later. Again, this is a totally optional step. You could not thicken up your gravy at all, or you could do it later with some cornstarch and water. You could smash your veggies. There's so many different ways to thicken it up if you want to. This is just how I do it. Let's talk about cooking liquid. Today I'm using beef stock. Extra points if you have homemade. You can use beef broth. You can use water and bouillon. Better than bouillon. I just don't recommend that you use just plain water. Like I said, if you're not adding flavor, you're taking it away. I'm gonna start with about four cups and then I can always add more later if it starts to reduce too much. Scrape the bottom of the pan a little bit to get any of the flour and veggies off the bottom. Now we're gonna add some seasoning. This is about two teaspoons of Worcestershire sauce and about one of hot sauce. I'm also adding about a fourth of a teaspoon to half a teaspoon of garlic powder, onion powder, black pepper, and tonies. The seasoning is gonna depend on how salty your stock is and your seasoning, so salt to taste. Time to add the meat back in. Once the meat's returned to the pot and it's simmering, I turn it down to medium, medium low heat and put the lid on it. For cooking time, you basically wanna let it simmer for as long as you have. I've done as few as two, two and a half hours before. I don't really recommend that, but if you have a really smaller piece of meat, maybe a certain cut, you can get away with it. I definitely say minimum three hours is a good place to start. You can go all the way to six, seven hours. Again, how much time do you have? Personally, I started this a little bit too late in the day, and so I'm gonna simmer it covered for about two hours and uncovered for one hour. I like to keep it covered for most of the cooking time and then do my reducing at the end, but you can also just leave it uncovered for all of your cooking time and add liquid as needed. It's been about three hours and the meat's falling off the bone. I'm hungry, so I'm gonna go ahead and say that it's ready. As you can see, this pot is pretty wide. It's an original Magnolite, like I said, and so it's refurbished, but the lid doesn't fit absolutely perfectly, so it ended up reducing kind of on its own. I did three hours covered and about 10 minutes uncovered. I think I reduced it a little too far, so I added a little more stock. It's one of those balancing acts where you can just take the cut of meat you have, the liquid you're using, how much liquid, how big your pot is, how high your heat is, and kind of get to the consistency that you like. I'm really happy with this consistency and as you make this a few times, you'll find out where you like it too. Here's our steak and gravy about five hours later. It looks amazing, it smells amazing. I put it over some white rice, let's try it. I've made a lot of rice and gravy and I've had even more and I have to say this is a good plate of steak and gravy. The quality of the beef really shines through here. The full recipe and directions will be on my website with love, jillianblair.com. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Made in Louisiana.